Welcome to Beyond the Press Release, a production for Gorecom, when we take the time to speak with small cap executives right after they put out important news. With us today, you can see him on the screen, not one, but two executives uh, with us. Cameron Shell, you all know him. He's been on before. Great interviews. Chairman, CEO of Dragonfly, trades on the CSC under DFLY, DFLYF in the U.S., not for long, hopefully, uh, as they're graduating up. And for our friends in Europe on Frankfurt under 3U8, also with him for the first time ever, really happy to have him, Dinesh Kanenchata, Chairman, Windfall Geotech, trades on the venture under WIN, and for friends of the UN in the US, WINKF on the OTCQB. Most of us know drones as cool toys flying around the neighborhood or even simple commercial apps for things like real estate videos. But for those of you new to Dragonfly, they're an award winning drone manufacturer and technology developer. They're not just the drones. They're way beyond that drone technology, drone solutions, uh, and some examples recent, and there are a number of them, so I won't go through all of them. Uh, COVID detection on campuses, film sets, even inside of prisons with their, with their brand new camera systems, drone-based air support defense systems, uh, and even inside the brains inside uh, autonomous security robots. Windfall, on the other hand, a mining services company, a leader, in the use of artificial intelligence and advanced knowledge extraction techniques in the mining sector since 2005. So they've been around. Their algorithms are designed and employed by Windfall uh, to, and calculated to highlight areas of interest that have the potential to be geologically similar to other gold deposits and mineralization. So they're mine finders, in essence, using artificial technology. Together, here's the headline, Dragonfly and Windfall, Geotech advanced testing of drone-based AI solution for land mine detection. It's powerful. It's exciting. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, as always, Roy. Hey, Cam, I'm going to start with you because, you know, I, A, you're, 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 you're the veteran here. B, is this another example of how Dragonfly continues to differentiate itself as not a drone company, but a drone technology company? Yeah, I, and thank, thanks for that, uh, George, and and, uh, and always we're just, we're, I, you know, I've had the great pleasure of working with Dinesh on past projects, which have always worked out great. He's an incredible technology builder. He has a fantastic management track record and completely represents the type of organization that we feel very lucky to be able to work with. 100% Dragonfly is all about creating a solution. You know, putting an airframe up and, uh, you know, being able to fly around. I mean, that was cool 20 years ago. Yep. What you need to do today is to deliver value add to your customer. You need to deliver an immediate ROI so that when they look at the opportunity of working with you, it's not a question of if they're going to do it, but really only when and how they're going to do it. And and what has happened with in terms of working with uh, Dinesh uh, in particular in his organization is that we have actually created a solution that's uncompetable. We've created a solution that other companies, whether they're flight service companies or whether they're mining exploration companies or whether they're AI companies can't compete with. We, we've got something completely and totally unique and we've got entrance into a multi-billion dollar market, both on the mining side and on the defense and public safety side as it relates to landmines. And more than just lip service, you guys have got a great quote from Admiral Hayward, former head of the US Navy and member Joint Chiefs of Staff who said, for years, a foundation has supported organizations removing landmines. Land this type of technology innovation by Dragonfly and Windfall is exactly what is needed to solve this global challenge on a massive scale. Dinesh, how do you feel when you hear that kind of third-party validation? Because the fact of the matter is, me and everyone at home watching this or listening have no idea how good your AI tech is. We need that third-party validation. You got through Dragonfly, but you got that from Admiral Hayward. Man, how does it feel to hear, to read something like that? Well, there's you know two things. One is I'm humbled. Uh, I'm humbled by um, our service men and women who work every day uh, to keep our, our country safe. And the, uh, the good admiral, my dad was in the Royal Navy. Um, I have a ton of respect for our service people. And my background is has, I spent 10 years in public safety and working with uh, s some really incredible men and women who are selflessly working to keep um, keep the quality of life we all have and the freedoms we have. So to hear that from, um, from the Admiral is, uh, is humbling. Uh, I'm just grateful to be part of it. I know, I know Cam feels the same way. Like, you know, our part is tiny. Our part is tiny. We get to 
we get to work on computers and work with really cool technology, you know, and frankly, uh, the men and women in the field who have to put their lives on the line, they deserve the credit. So let's, let's talk about your technology. Now you've gone to the outside observer. I know you haven't done it all in one day. This is not overnight, but to the outside observer, you guys have gone from mine detection, which are really, really massive structures underground, still not easy to find, but man, they're, you know, they're big to land mine detection, right? How did you, how were you able to, to transform your technology into that kind of minutia and how reliable have you guys found it to be? Great question. Um, you know, the analogy I use is similar, is those of you who like math, I'm a technologist. So, you know, we learned in like high school math, we heard about similar triangles. You know, they, they look the same, but they might be different sizes, but like they look similar. Um, and uh, it's, it's, very, it's very analogous for landmines and mineralization. So huge deposits, but really deep in the ground. So it requires very, very strong equipment, very um, effective engineering to be able to, bi to uh, get the data that you need so that you can create a signature so that you can identify if there's an opportunity for a mine there. Landmines, very small, but very close to the surface. It does um, yeah, the military, much. no no good to put a, a landmine, you know, 180 feet into the ground. So you're six inches off the surface, usually. Um, and, you know, where you're overgrown with things like um, uh, grass and, and trees. But to a mag, those things are invisible. So what it allows you to do is look for the core components okay. that you'd find in a landmine. And, you know, many of this, the, the, the truly horrific thing about landmines is that most of the technology is World War I technology. So a lot, most of the landmines that are out there are from World War I, World War II, from the Vietnam War. These are big, heavy iron plates. Absolutely, there are, um, you know, plastic and um, uh, liquid mines that, landmines that are out in, in de, uh, that have been deployed in uh, conflict zones. But we can get 80% of the problem solved by big, heavy iron plates. Well, why wouldn't you? strap a mag onto a drone and go out, go and scan that and thereby go and identify where those things are. So you know, when a kid wants to go out and play soccer in a field, they don't have to worry about getting their legs blown up. So Cam, uh, clearly this has been a major problem and you've got, just as Dinesh was saying that you got really old mines for the most part, really old stuff. You probably, they, the, the, the task in hunting for them has probably not been using the most cutting edge technology either. So when you said earlier, your combined tech is incomparable, right? Um, put that into context for us. I know, look, we all know you're a chairman, you're a CEO, so we expect to say great things, but you're not a guy who chooses his words lightly either. Uh, you know, how incomparable and how great of a solution is this to a global problem? Yeah, the big difference, thanks for those kind words. The, the big differentiator here, frankly, is the AI. And uh, so listen, we've been working on this project for well over a year and a half, and we've been flying multiple tests and pulling test data from all over the world. So uh, we've got uh, an incredible amount of uh, people and organizations involved with this. It's one thing to take a mag sensor and put it over a piece of iron and, you know, and it, it shows positive, if you will. Like, okay, well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do that. I mean, it takes sure. a good pilot and a good sensor and not anybody I can, do, can do it, I guess. But the reality is that that doesn't necessarily give you a positive. It might give you a false positive, and it might actually be not. You, you, there's lots of times where you'll miss things just because of corrosion or, or any number of uh, different materials that, uh, that are used or sensitivities. However, when you have got reams of test data to pile on top of that, you can apply AI to it to actually you know, come up with more targets and likely targets and see patterns in targets and fields and, and pull history into it and conflicts, like all of the, the, the relevant data that isn't necessarily direct data that actually helps you identify uh, a particular zone and pull all the landmines out of there. That's really the difference is that advanced AI. And it, you know, that's what we saw in our vital intelligence technology. Sure, there's people that can do you know, a temperature, but you know, are there people that can do heart rates and respiratory rates and SpO2 level? Those are, the, those are the other pieces of data that really help determine if somebody has an infectious condition. And so similar in landmine detection, oh, look, you can get you know, the, the, the temperature, which would be the equivalent of, hey, is there a piece of metal there? But that doesn't tell you, uh, that really doesn't help you clear a minefield. 
And so the work that Dinesh has done with his scientists in conjunction with all the test data and, the, and the, the, the ecosystem of people we have involved to actually solve this problem, that's the difference. And it, un, unless you really have the combined resources and people that, uh, that Dinesh has with Windfall and that we have at Dragonfly and the experience and the background in the military, et cetera, you're not gonna be able to solve this problem. And, and so we really feel that we have a completely you know, uncompetable offering as we go out to the world in the market with this. Yeah, now you if, say if that. If I could just add one thing. Yeah, of course, George, just because, too. yeah, because look, we didn't come to Dragonfly. Like they weren't, they weren't the first guy we called. Like we started looking at this problem more than two years ago. Michelle, I think in 2018, our, our CEO uh, really started looking into this and whether it was possible. We approached four different drone companies to be able to identify somebody who could partner with us. We knew we had the AI um, and you know, Cam's a humble guy. So he's completely uh, you know, kind of talking down his technology. But you know, the reality is we went to four different companies. We ran tests, like they weren't able to bring that engineering expertise, the combination of being able to um, suspend an instrument from a drone, manage the payload in addition to being able to fly a, a, a good survey and then extract the data. These are non-trivial problems for on an engineering perspective and also from a data science perspective. So like we got to CAM probably, you know, I wish we'd got there first, I would have saved a year, but you know, we, we got there around <laughs> number four and guess what? Like their engineering expertise was what really separated them from all of the other service providers that we started working with. And, you know, that plus, you know, their phenomenal access to market, which is something that transparently we don't have. We're a mining and digital exploration company. That's what we know. Um, we don't have that, you know, access to yeah. market. And, you know, that's something Cam's done a great job, um, you know, building in that confidence in what he's doing so that, you know, he can, um, he can't take this solution because it's, you know, it doesn't matter how great your technology is. If nobody knows about it, nobody implements it, you know, it becomes a science experiment. That's and, not the goal here. And we have Cam, to do something that's uh, going to make a difference. And Cam, so not to go too far off the beaten path, but if you couldn't, because I love the explanation you, you once gave when we talked about your most recent patent, how it's not just like Dinesh had strapping on some kind of sensor to the bottom of his drone and flying it around you have to be able to handle that payload, angles, weather, wind, all those. And that's where you guys are really, really powerful. Uh, explain the importance of that in like 30, I know you can't do it all, but just to give people a good flavor in about 30, 45 seconds that, man, you have to be able to handle, you know, the, the technology and the camera and everything in the right way. Otherwise the solution just doesn't work. And, and people take it for granted, but it's a very difficult challenge that you guys have overcome, right? Well, we, we, I think we overcome it in a number of ways. I think we overcome it with fantastic people and great pilots and a, and a culture of like just deep, deep, uh, you know, caring about, about the projects that we take on and do. Um, but beyond that, you know, but there are other companies that do great jobs at that too. Beyond that, the difference here, is, it quite frankly, is the software and the AI. Uh, so we, we can build up great confidence with customers. We do have excellent access. Uh, we look at our board of directors, there's probably not anybody in the world that we can't get in touch with. Um, but the reality is with, with we, we understand clearly it's a total solution. So it's, 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 it's process and it's practice. And then it's that AI software. And, and sen we do have highly sensitive uh, and, and proprietary sensors that work with this as well. But without Dinesh's AI software and without like the experience that we've gained together to do that, it, it, it actually, you know, it compensates for a lot of the things that, you, that are kind of uncompensatable in the environment. Um, and, uh, and, and it builds all the pattern and decision matrix in there so that we can actually do a better job. So again, while Dinesh was, is being very kind, I, I, you know, putting a mag on and flying a field doesn't, doesn't qualify you to find mines. It doesn't qualify you to save lives. It's much more serious than that. And that software is required. So guys, let's get on to the business side. So obviously there's a two, there's two beautiful mission statements here. One, and most importantly, there are predominantly children dying every single day and they've been dying for days, for years and decades. So that's the primary mission statement. There's no doubt about that. But you guys also both public companies and you've got investors. So let's talk about the business side of this. Uh, we know that there, from the press release, there are between 60 and 110 million mines uh, that, that 
they, the estimates, there still haven't been found yet. Uh, landmines, I'm sorry, I should say mine, landmines. So let's call it 80 million, 85 million, split the difference there. Um, how, what's the revenue, what's the business model and how fast do you get to market and how does this roll out? So maybe I can, I can take that one. We've been looking at this in, uh, in great detail, roughly $700 million um, per year is what we ex what the expected market is. It, it's, it's phenomenal, it's huge um, as a business opportunity. Um, most of that money is being spent on uh, very low tech solutions. Um, we talked about our servicemen and women. Now, those are the people that are out there with you know, metal detectors and other uh, forms of fairly low tech putting their life in danger to right. clear these um clear these in these conflict zones and you know my my hat goes off and my heart goes out to them because they're doing it uh they're doing it as a great service um to the local populations yeah and you know this is the reason why we need something you know radically different technology has allowed us a way to solve this problem without putting human lives at risk and um we're still in the early days. We still have a lot of testing to do. We're just getting started here. Um, but you know, there's there is a you know there's an onus on us as business leaders to leverage technology and capital markets to uh, both drive value for investors, but to also make the world a safer place. I mean, this is the reason why guys like Cam and I entered public safety. It's because there are lots of ways you can make money. Right. This is a great way to make money for everybody and also make the world a better place. Amazing. It's Amazing. pretty tough to find something around uh, where that where you can kind of meet those two missions and bring them together. So a uh, huge market potential, uh, fairly concentrated access, primarily NGOs and government bodies. So very easy if you have the access and the reputation, easy to get to the people who make the decisions. You have to demonstrate that you have the technology you can deliver, that, that's table stakes for me, for sure. I know it is for Cam, we're gonna demonstrate it. We're gonna be careful. We're gonna do it the right way because we wanna make sure that our reputation of our businesses and our, and our technology um, are enhanced by what we're doing. Um, but we're gonna solve this thing. It's, we're gonna do it, it's a marathon, we're gonna do it. And uh, um, you know, it's, 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 we're gonna make a lot of money along the way. So we all we all can put a big smile on our face. Your guys, Cam, your target market, because uh, Dinesh said something interesting there. NGOs, non-governmental organizations, so on and so forth. Devil's advocate, because I was thinking about that until Dinesh said that. Landmines aren't found in downtown New York, in LA, in Toronto, where there are resources and cash and money and people to you know, who would pay to get rid of these things. They're typically found in mostly, I would assume, uh, third world underdeveloped countries that don't have these budgets who pays you guys at the end of the day and i guess dinesh you kind of hinted at that but you know who who pays you guys in the day to get this 700 million dollar a year potential market uh cleaned up yeah so there there's certainly the um <clears throat> uh i i guess they call it the philanthropic you know the word i'm trying to say yep. uh aspect to it and there's money out there that, that funds us but the reality is for governments the roi to clean up mines or minefields or the reputation around it is is extreme so my, mines were put where people are right so so we may think that hey they're they're off in third world countries those are the most populous countries in the world with the fastest growing economies in the world okay. and those mines were put either where people are or where people travel so trade routes and things like that so whether it's roads whether it's schools those are still the same populated areas or the areas that are now becoming populated they also tend to be around uh, areas where there's natural resources or there's things like running river or waters or dams or those so the right. ROI for a county or, or a district or a nation to get that cleaned up so that proper development can happen in there, it's it, like one mine goes off and that's it. That area can't get developed for eons until there's a huge effort, both tactically and from a PR standpoint to ensure that that area is cleaned out and then they can, re so, so there, there's lots of money to go behind this, usually as those okay. areas start to develop out from a critical national infrastructure perspective, they have to be cleaned up. Now, ethically, they have to be cleaned up. 
But practically, the reason they, they, they get paid to get cleaned up is because the ROI of that development dollar that's happening in those particular regions. The other thing that, you, you know, Dinesh really spoke to well was the fact that the way mines are cleared today is there's, there's the same way that mines were cleared, you know, in World War One. There's big cat fives or big machines throwing chains around or there's people finding them and all the rest of it, which is crazy. But what there isn't really even today is how do you verify after you really don't know if that field's clear. Like that's the, that is yeah. the, that's the big issue. And ultimately that's a, a higher level of assurance that we're going to be able to provide with not just the sensor technology, but also the AI technology. When you think about AI and how it gets applied in, it's just not about finding the mind. It's about finding the pattern of how those minds uh, were set. What happened in history during that time? What are some of the other possible routes up at that site? You know, you don't know what's happening in a time of war. And so why somebody decided to, you know, mine a particular field that makes no sense to mine now. And the only way it gets discovered is some poor kid or worker, you know, steps on it like that. Like, so it's the predictive analysis and then the verification afterwards to start to provide some level of assurance. Uh, that's where the real value is. And, and I, listen, I, I've never seen a nation, it, you know, I can't speak overly uh, with a huge amount of experience here, but I've never seen a scenario where where somebody's going to go into a development situation and they're not they don't clearly understand that to avoid disaster, the ROI is, you know, ex exponentially high. It's, and so that's we, we, we'll see. We, we see good budgets in this now, about seven hundred million dollars a year with some success and people like but largely it's only seven hundred million because people are ignoring the problem. It's not all that's a big number. It's just like, it's like oh, number. well, it, it, that, that number probably should be five times that amount. And I, I think with wow. some success and some good news happening out there, that it's like, hey, we did clear this field and here was the success story and here's the, here's the settlement that's going in afterwards or here's the natural resource that was developed because of it or et cetera, et cetera, that the ROI becomes apparent, the PR becomes you know, advantageous. And those budgets go up exponentially. And so over the course of the next 10 years, I think we'll see that $700 million a year go into the billions of dollars per year. Yeah, Ken, thanks for, you know what? Thanks for bringing that to the attention of shareholders. Because look, there comes a point when investors at home have to be able to assess, you know, the potential value of this to their holdings. And I didn't think about that. I just thought up till now, it's a fantastic humanitarian, philanthropic uh, endeavor. And, and, People don't want George, to die anymore, George. but you're right. Stops development. If I find 20 landmines somewhere, I'm not celebrating. I'm thinking, oh man, how do I know there are another 50 here? Yeah. So and it's, not, that, it's just, and it's just not that property that now doesn't get developed. It's the reputation of the whole country. Yeah. Right. All property values go down. All development resource values go down. All commodities in the in the industry, or excuse me, in that region go down because of one landmine. So the the ROI, the, we'll, we'll get we'll get great dollars for this. And, and one one you know, and I guess you know, a great tragedy and one sad thing is we're putting more in the ground. Oh, I didn't so realize that. I didn't realize putting more in the ground. We continue to put more in the ground. So this problem doesn't go away. I mean, I wish it would go away. I desperately wish it would go away. Yeah, it'd be great if there were just these doesn't go away. landmines and that's it. And you could make a great living the next 10 years finding them, but they, they are going to continue. So guys, what's the ETA? You guys are at the point where I'm going to read this. You're at advanced field testing of the Eagle Eye landmine detection solution. Um, what's the ET, what's next to be done? And if everything went well as expected, and we know nothing goes perfect, but if it goes pretty much as well as expected, when you guys expect to have, to go to market and have something ready to really, really go with. So usually how this works, the go to market on this kind of technology works is, um, you need to access an inventory of different types of landmines. So we've got access to a inventory of roughly 50 different classes of, of, um, uh, ordnance. Uh, we're going to have to run through the tests of each of those different classes of ordnance so that we can have a nice broad base for which to begin field testing, i.e. in the conflict zones. Um, there, is an, there is a um, database of, uh, that, that isn't perfect, but does say what types of ordnance were uh, placed in certain zones. So they don't know exactly, they don't know the pattern or any of those kinds of things, but we do know that there's a certain, we, we are able to tell the class of ordinance. So our goal is to this, build a large enough database that will be able to uh, begin going out into, you know, really the highest impact zones. Um, you know, there's North Africa is very badly impacted, the Middle East, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, COVID has a big factor because obviously until COVID, we get COVID kind of under control, getting out 
and, and getting into the field and, and working on these problems is problematic, but we are able to really work on the testing and preparation over the course of the next you know, six months or so. So our plan is this, is you know, get to a, um, a, a presentable field trial and we're hopeful that the channels to market that, you know, the, um, that Dragonfly has will allow us to do a technical demonstration. Um, there's dedicated money both from the Canadian government, US government, um, and um, uh, NATO in this area. So that's once we have a, a, a demonstrable prototype, it's then to go and get some funding to put together a field test with the appropriate decision makers. And then once we have that step completed, it's about you know, getting in there and, and beginning to pick the first couple of zones. I, I, I expect that we could see um, you know, revenue in the form of uh, market develop, uh, technology development funds before the end of the year. Um, and then beyond that, uh, you know, getting out and looking at contracts. Most of these contracts are uh, multi-year contracts. So once you win them, you're gonna be working for years and years um, on the problem. So very lucrative, seven figure, eight figure contracts um, that uh, you know, take some time to get, up, get going. But once they get going, they can build a solid foundation for us to develop follow on technologies. Cam, last words, because there's so much that we can, uh, you know, really dive into here. But I think everyone's got a great idea now of the tech, where you guys are at, what the market is. Fantastic. Anything that we haven't covered, last words before we sign off. Yeah, no, I just think it's worth noting that when you're doing these projects that that are about market potential and 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 for anybody that follows Dragonfly, you know that we, we don't do something unless we already have a customer that we're doing it with, we're doing it for. So, uh, you know, this isn't a waterfall type project where, hey, we think we're going to build something and hopefully somebody's going to come. We're deeply embedded already in terms of where we're going to be working, how we're going to be working, where we're getting our test data, uh, because there's a real there's a real problem, an acute problem that needs to be solved. The, the, the additional benefit, which is, is, is as great as the opportunity, is the fact that as we do this work and we get better and better at mag sensor work and the, and the AI stuff that our joint teams, but in particular Dinesh teams, is working on, is that if we look at our mining prospect business, uh, the ability to uh, you know, look at the geophysics and, and all the techniques that we learn here all have applicability back into the commodity world of which you know, we're already becoming a demonstrated leader uh, in. And so there's a lot of spinoffs that come, that come out of this project. Uh, we definitely, you know, we, we look to less than a year to have significant revenue uh, out of this particular initiative. Uh, but the spinoff benefits, uh, just in terms of our techniques, our, our technology, our ability to work together, uh, and, and, and the credibility that we get, not just in the mining space, but also the credibility that we get uh, with our military clients in terms of uh, the importance right. of the mission and, and such, all have you know, uh, intrinsic benefit as well. Gents, fair to say that people will be watching, and this is interesting, it's almost like a time capsule, but investors will be watching this interview at the end of this decade, December 31st, 2029, look back and say, wow, look at that. These two companies and these two guys started, you know, really started letting us know about this back in 2021. And now it's going strong and saving people and generating economic benefit for those underdeveloped nations that are, you know, get rid of these landmines and creating great shareholder value. I mean, it's amazing. I didn't realize the, you know, the depth of the opportunity and how big and how long lasting it is. So uh, wish, you, wish you guys both success and can't wait to have you both back on here. Uh, to discuss it further as you guys move this forward. You're amazing, George. Yeah, thanks. thanks a lot for your interest, George. I really appreciate it. No, thank you guys, man. It's an easy topic. It's a great topic. Nothing better than, uh, you know, being invested in companies uh, that you can make a great profit on and then knowing at night you go to bed saying, hey, uh, my small, tiny investment in this company and for everyone else who's watching, listening, their small, tiny investment in these companies or sometimes big investments are also saving kids, families, all that. That's fantastic, guys. Wishing you great success. Thanks so much. For everybody at home, you got to do your due diligence. You've been watching or listen to both Cameron Shell, CEO of Dragonfly, DFLY on the CSE, DFLYF on the OTCQB. Get to their hub in Agoracom. Look at the profile page. We know that drone technology solutions is something really deep that you need to understand. It's all there laid out for you then link over the Dragonfly site to do, your, in, uh, to do more due diligence. For uh, Windfall Geotech, not a client of Gorcom yet, but we're gonna try and twist his arm and see if we can make it happen. But to do, your, uh, to, do, to, do your, to do your due diligence on the company, make sure to go over to Windfall Geotech site 
and they trade on the TSX venture and the stock symbol WIN. And for our friends in the US, WINKF. That's OTCQB. Thanks for joining us. Do your due diligence. And for all of you who've been watching this, we're going to be watching this December 30th, 2029. Don't say we didn't tell you so. Have a great day. See you next time.